All right. Greetings, my fellow free and buzz and thinkers. This is LO3's news podcast. My name is Craig, transmitting from the beautiful Swampy Mangroves, South Florida. In today's date, February 28th, 2017, on a Tuesday, to be exact. Ooh, yeah, man. Not so far, this year's flying by. <laughs> Soon we'll all be sweating our tails off down here. Yeah, I'm at CJ's Lounge, located at 400 Southwest First Avenue, along the beautiful New River of Fort Lauderdale, Florida, right by the um, Andrews Avenue Bridge, with the other side of the downtown or saloon. Legend, it's a landmark to be exact. I don't know if we have really much to rant over, with all sincerity. However, how to get a some few chuckles in here. It's in reference to um, mainly Donald Trump. And like I tell everyone, I see a lot of his pros and cons, and it's understandable. And that's why I'm not going to go on these little parades and rallies and get angry and scream at the top of my lungs because a lot of the folks out there are mainly focusing on baseless Entitlements. I, myself, is focusing on we're going to pursue the status quo or make it back into a constitutional republic. So without further ado, I want to start it off here. Came off from Daily Sheeple. A couple of stuff will be coming from Daily Sheeple. And um, it's Jesse Ventura himself. Who withdraws Trump's support with Epic Post? He's going against the people's will. It's by Melissa Dykes, by the way. Got some good stuff. Always check it out. It says here, former Governor Jesse Ventura of conspiracy theory fame has officially withdrawn support of President Donald Trump. The last straw for Ventura was the Trump's administration's recently announced war on legalized marijuana. Ventura wrote, I thought, the, I thought Donald Trump ran his campaign as the man of the people, someone who vowed to end a corporate takeover of our government, someone who vowed to bring back jobs, even thinking about reversing state laws and making legalized recreational marijuana illegal, is going against the people's will. This is going against job creation and a reliable part of us of the state's economy. The citizens of these states voted to make recreational marijuana legal. It wasn't the politicians, it was we the people. Obviously, President Trump is following in the footsteps of every president that came before him. He thinks that government knows what is best for us. He's been president for a little over a month, and he's already forgotten that we, the people, are the government. And he's planning on reinstating private prisons. Let's connect the dots. Private prisons need to be 80 to 90 percent full to be profitable. If they aren't, then states pay a fine. Nonviolent drug offenders make it possible for private prisons to be full. Reverse legalized recreational marijuana and private prisons will remain full. That's his plan, people. Eight states have fully legalized marijuana at this point, and another 17 are in the process. Not only do 59% of the Americans feel that marijuana should be fully legalized, but a whooping 71% also believe the federal government should respect the rights of the states where voters do choose to legalize it. The thousands of angry responses to Ventura Post proves that. There's a couple of them right here, and I'll just, I'll write, I'll do a few. Why why not? James Marks is all on, on Facebook. You killed it, Jesse Ventura. Want to make America great again? Legalize it all. Let's bring back a hemp industry that was dominant in the early 1900s of this free country. We shouldn't be forced to use toxic plastic materials that poison the world where, when hemp can do plastic's job and it's helpful for the environment. And this is what No Canalist said. I'm a huge Trump supporter, but his views on marijuana will make the people of America revolt. We, the people, do not want continued prohibition of marijuana in any way, shape, or form. The people have spoken. We want complete legalization of marijuana. 
as a citizen of the United States and as a disabled Army infantry veteran. I have every right to ingest marijuana if I so choose. How can anyone justify the reasoning behind legal alcohol that ruins lives and kill astronomical amounts of people every year, while prohibition on one of the safest substances known to man exists? Marijuana has countless health benefits and has killed no one. It actually prevents and treats successfully many illnesses and disease. How can our government justify that this is a Schedule One narcotic? Law is only law if this is being governed, agree to follow this ignorant law. Very well. Jake Flett wrote, Anyone who thought someone who lives in a golden tower with his name on it was going to be a champion of the people was a moron. <laughs> Those are good comments regardless, folks. Like I so always say before, government, the people have to remain vigilant in these areas. And I'll continue on here. This one place where Trump will lose support across the board. The president can say he's for states' rights all day long, but that isn't going to amount to much if he fills his administration with people like Sessions who directly contradict him in actual practice. So if you're going to say one thing and you're going to have you or your lackeys contradict that, I call it the Mitt Romney syndrome. Another political bunch of political bobbleheads trying to make you believe Sell so you a, a pair of pants that looks like crap, but said it fits you beautifully. This is why I get a big kick out of this, my friends. I've been laughing so hard on these areas. And everyone goes, oh, we made a difference. You got to put their feet to the damn fire. And this is why I tell folks, 10th Amendment is a solution. However, I'm going to continue on here from an open letter to Jesse Ventura by Kurt Nemo. And it came out, it says here, it came out yesterday, because Jesse, I see you reverse your support for Donald Trump. I believe this is a positive step. Donald Trump is not the man he claimed to be during the campaign. First and foremost, it was obvious from the start he has little idea what needs to be done to turn this country around. As the campaign progressed, Trump began to say very disturbing things, most notably in regard to war. Trump criticized Bush's war was a mistake. He said the invasion and the occupation of Afghanistan was a mistake, but he did not call for pulling the troops out. He said in October, at, his, at this point, you probably have to stay because that thing will collapse about two seconds after they leave. He did not elaborate how the presence of our troops that will prevent it from collapsing. If Carter and his National Security Advisor Brzezinski had not baited the Soviets in Afghanistan and supported the Mujahideen, the current situation would not exist. This is rarely talked about. Trump does not talk about it. The establishment media ignores it and is not on the alt alt rights radar. In October, Trump made it sound like the U.S. has a weak and effective military. He wants to spend billions to rebuild it. According to the London-based International Institute for Strategic Studies, annual military ba- balance report in 2015, the U.S. spent $581 billion of defense. China came in second at $129 billion. Russia spent $70 billion. Less than Saudi Arabia, $81 billion. In a total, $687 billion was spent worldwide. Trump said while Syria is a mess, he must have gone in after the U.S. and his propaganda media said al-Assad has launched a chemical attack. It was discovered months before Trump made the statement that Syria wasn't responsible for the attack. Obama admitted responsibly, responsibility for the chemical attack on Gotha in August 2013 was not a slam dunk. In 2015, it was reported Turkey had transferred chemical weapon, weapons to Al Nusra, Nusra, a terror group supported by Qatar. The following year, trucks 
carrying chemical weapons were spotted in Halepo, in the Halepo, at the time controlled by El Nusra. The media in Russia and Europe reported on this, but it was virtually ignored by the corporate propaganda media in America. Donald Trump's remark on Iran are disturbing. He has surrounded himself with neocon escort advisors who want the, to target Iran. The primary culprit here was here was General Michael Flynn who resigned over baseless claim. He somehow conspired with the Russians. Flynn and Steve Bannon advocate a war against Islam. Bannon also also has also suggested confronting China in the South China Sea. Trump is also looking at North Korea. Army Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster wants war with Russia. The neocons love him. The liberal interventionists love him. The media loves him. And the entire political establishment loves him, writes Mike Whitney. The downside of McMaster is that he is a hard-boiled militarist with a driving animus towards Russia. Judging by his writing on the topic, I would expect a broader and more lethal conflict to flare up in either Syria or Ukraine as soon as he gets settled in his new job. Thomas L. Knapp characterizes Trump's foreign policy as Obama's third term, Bush's fifth. Knapp points out how Trump has routinely flip-flopped. One minute he talked about like a non-interventionist, the next minute he railed about rebuilding a U.S. military that's already most powerful and expensive war machine on the face of the earth and has been since World War II, he writes. One minute he was for good relations with other countries, the next he was threatening to reverse Obama's two real foreign policy successes, the nuclear deal with Iran and the thawing of relations with Cuba. Matt Bryce is indeed business as usual on the foreign policy front. The drone strike continues. Navy SEALs have murdered dozens of civilians, including an 8-year-old American girl in Yemen. Instead of withdrawing troops from Syria, Trump touts escalation of American movement with the establishment of safe zones to corral war refugees. He's even turned on his supposed friend Vladimir Putin, promising an extension of sanctions against Russia on behalf of Ukraine's regime. Talking about Grand Chessboard 101 by Zygmunt Brzezinski, huh? Time to take off the rose-colored glasses. Donald Trump is the war party's dream president. Trump's aggressive, skin-thinned, and petulant behavior made it obvious months ago he will not only be a poor choice as a commander-in-chief, but a dangerous and predictable one as well. I expect Tea Party Republicans to support him, but I was truly surprised when libertarians did the same. In addition to libertarians, much of the alternative media also rallied behind Trump. They portray him as a defender of liberty and the Constitution. It didn't seem to phase them when hours after assuming office, Trump signed a large number of unconstitutional executive orders. My candidate for president was sabotaged in 2012 by the same people who are now lined up behind Trump. Unfortunately, there is nobody qualified to replace them, and even if there were, he or she would be taken down by the establishment and attack its and its attack dog media. One party system has made it structurally impossible for third party candidates to compete. Jesse, I am afraid the only viable solution to end this war, corporate cronyism and an economic control by bankers is the fall of the empire. This will happen and eventually millions of Americans will suffer. The political system is a three card monte. It's rigged against the American people. It will continue on its current course, mendering a total, toward total war and destruction until the men in green eye shades are removed from power. I doubt this will happen. Donald Trump's election victory, victory is indication enough the American people will continue to buy empty promises and ignore reality. Yep. This is why. And there's times I will defend Trump on certain areas. And there's others I will condemn him and be critical. And I do it with merit. That is the main idea. 
That's why I want all, all my fellow brothers and sisters out there. Doesn't matter what your belief system is. You have to always remain vigilant. Because if you don't, then it will backfire on you. And you go, and you go, um, how come I didn't know that? I trust the man. You never trust the government, period. Even if it's your best friend, your husband, wife, father, mother, etc. And Thomas Jefferson said it the best. Is um, one of his great quotes, which I'm going to add this to the memo. I say, why not? I'm going to add this to the memo. Vigilance is the price of liberty. The price of liberty is eternal vigilance. That's by Thomas Jefferson. Something to think about, right? Absolutely. I'm going to add that to, to that list. So at least you folks can understand. This is what I'm coming from. Because if you don't, you'll keep the status quo going. And I am going to add that to there. Yes. Wendell Phillips, excuse me, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. Wendell Phillips wrote that. And there's a bunch of them in here too. And I'm going to add that to here. And have those here, those who expect to reap the blessings of freedom must, like men, undergo the fatigue of supporting it. Thomas Paine, The American Crisis, number four, in 1777. The only thing is necessary for the triumph of evil is for a good men to do nothing. Edmund Burke. So I'm going to put that link on here from freedomkeys.com. I think it's the right thing to do. And I like what it says right down here. A couple of them. By John Adams, it is weakness rather than wickedness which renders men unfit to be trusted with unlimited power. That's in 1788. And we get the one here, Thomas Jefferson. Free government is founded in jealousy, not confidence. It is jealousy and not confidence which prescribes limited constitutions to bind those we are obliged to trust with power. In questions of power, then, let no more be heard of confidence in men, but bind him down for mischief by the chains of the Constitution. Make this go on and on and on. You know what? I'm going to write this as a great quote here. The greatest tyrannies are always perpetuated in the name of the noblest causes. Thomas Paine. So I'm going to keep all that in there. Like I say, my friends, you got to stay on top of the game. And I'll do one more here. It says here, but you must remember, my fellow citizens, that eternal vigilance by the people is the price of liberty and that you must pay the price if you wish to secure the blessing. It behooves you, therefore, to be watchful in your states as well as in the federal government. Andrew Jackson's farewell address. March 4th, 1837. Alright. Next one here. Came from the Daily Sheep again by Melissa Dykes. And she does good work. Jeff Sessions just confirmed he's going to go after states with legalized marijuana. Claims it causes violence. And I said Dumbo with that photo. Absolutely. While Trump may claim he's for states' rights, Attorney General Jeff Sessions is just pissed on the opinions of about 71% of Americans who do not believe the federal government should attempt to ram federal laws down the throats of states who, where voters have legalized marijuana. After Press, um, press Secretary Sean Spicer essentially warned everyone last week that the Trump administration plans to crack down on states with recreational marijuana laws. AG Sessions backed that up on Monday with some bizarre statements. Prove the guy actually believes Murray for Madness was a documentary. Via political, most of you probably know, I don't think America is going to be a better place when more people of all ages and particularly young people start, start smoking pot. Sessions during 
said, said during an exchange with reporters at the Justice Department, I believe is an unhealthy practice and current levels of THC and marijuana are very high compared to what they were a few years ago. We're seeing real violence around that, Session said. Experts are telling me there's more violence around marijuana than one would think, and there's big money involved. Yeah, talk about Twilight Zone, huh? Nothing he said was backed by any facts. While the country has changed and that science has changed, Sessions proved he has not changed his views on marijuana in over 30 years. Not only does opi- opioid addiction go down, go down in the states that legalize as been verified by statistics, but there is any violence around marijuana. It's due entirely to the black market created by the phony drug war. Not the actual drug itself, it is pointed out by the chairman of drug policy reform group Marijuana Majority, Tom Angel. By talking about marijuana and violence, the Attorney General is inadvertently articulating the strongest argument that exists for legalization, which is allow regulated markets in a way that prohibition does not. Prohibition keeps drug cartels in business and needless puts thousands of Americans behind bars. But then again, that must be why Sessions also reversed the DOJ plan to phase out uh, for the for, for prison for, uh, for out for the for profit prisons last week. They're going to need somewhere to put all those nonviolent drug offenders once federal crackdown banging plant legalized and over half the country begins. So this is their goal. Support more victimless crime laws. It shows you how manly and pathetic this man is. Trying to figure that out, yeah? Really got to really start thinking about this. I do find it pretty damn insulting when you got some dumbed down hick who's been a career politician for 30 years. He's now an attorney general. Yeah, he's, he's great on firearm, firearms rights, which is fantastic. But the man still is anti-rights. Compromise one, you screw it all. That's why I'm talking about you, dumbed down, dumbo, dorking looking sessions. Is it true that you and Debbie Wiseman Schultz make love and both wore his and her towels while in your manifested cesspool abscess bathtub? It really boggles the mind like you're going to try to con a con man like myself and many others out there. We've been doing our homework. We've been putting out the truth. We're not some one-dimensional hacks that go like just only Trump bashers and, 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 you, and spew baseless garbage. You don't know what the hell you're talking about. You're just a complete chump on this topic as far as I'm concerned. And, um, and one more thing. Because there's a link for that on the Spicer says Fed's step up war against marijuana. So, um, guy is a full of crap. I'll say this, AG Sessions, anal anal goon, right? As AG we get stands for. And don't worry, I treat Erica Holder the same way like you, garbage, pathetic, weak, and dork, dorkish. Look at that! Look at that face. Yeah. You haven't studied what happened in the twenties of prohibition of alcohol. I recommend this: watch it, read it, and the truth will hurt. Now, I'm going to tweet you that too. I'm going to do that right now. Tweet you about nullify or. Prohibition. Okay? I'm going to do that right now and I'll be back, folks. Yeah, so I sent him a little tweet. And I was a bit more of a gentleman on that. I even though I made, make fun of his dorky look in that photo. Even though he could be a grandfather and so forth, I'm not going to crucify him in those areas, but I am critical on this decision to try to great, enhance the drug war. And that's why you got to look at it. How about it be your kids? You want them in federal prison or private prison for victim's crime laws? Attorney General Sessions? I don't. But I'll say this for a fact. We got the 10th Amendment and we got the 9th Amendment. The 9th Amendment 
the numerator rights, jury nullification. And everyone is waking up to that, my friend. So I, re I recommend you boldly recant this and apologize and let the states make their call and the federal government should not intervene. Federalist Papers 46, written by James Madison, talks about that. Read it when you have a chance. If not, step down. We don't need any more tyrannical individuals like yourself. All right. We don't need a Loretta Lynch or Eric Holder or another Alberto Gonzalez, non the status quo propaganda. His rhetoric is null and void, unacceptable. That's it. I won't digress. <laughs> All right, my friends, next one here. I'm going to add the uh, Nullify Chapter uh, 10th Amendments in a video on YouTube. Nullify Chapter 12, Defining Nullification. Very educational. And everyone has needs to examine this. All right. This came out yesterday from Anti Media. The Anti War? Let me see. Yeah, it's from Anti War. It came out a couple of days ago. So. All right, and this one's here. Pentagon seeks to expand U.S. involvement in Somalia fight. President Trump's recommendations from the Pentagon are starting to trickle in, and they seem to everywhere involve more escalation of U.S. involvement and increased flexibility for the Pentagon to order airstrikes in various countries to target apparent threats. And while it is not a high pro as high profile as recommendations expected, later this week in places like Syria... That's the case for Somalia as well, with the Pentagon seeking increased aid for the Somalian army. The moving of U.S. forces, special forces, closer to the front lines and loosening up restrictions on airstrikes. AFRICOM Chief General Thomas Baldhauser describes Somalia as a, our most preplexing challenge, saying that the U.S. needs to shift its focus toward weakening al-Shabaab enough that the African Union forces that have been in Somalia for a decade can finally defeat them. Despite being presented as a fresh perspective on the long fight in Somalia, the Pentagon recommendation is to go plan in wars everywhere, more direct U.S. involvement, more embedding of forces, and more airstrikes Less restrictions, a plan which hasn't worked well anywhere else. By Jason Dix. Well, who let the cows out? Enhance the empire, spend more money, use the Federal Reserve, let's be involved, get screwed in the end. That's why I don't believe in hype, my friends. I'm pretty focused and observe. That's why I told people the debates were horrendously pathetic. Doesn't matter who was going to be in there. Even if Hillary Clinton was in there, it'd be the same status quo. Well, let's look up status quo, shall we? Let's see if it's in the um, legal dictionary here. Yeah, I guess um, a law dictionary, excuse me, law dictionary. My mistake, friends. Yeah, I'm a, I goofed up there. Let's see what's in LawDictionary.com, right? Yeah, I'm just going to type this up. And um, I'm do a look up. So, time and time again, folks never will learn. When will this stop? Correct? Absolutely. There's a Nolo Free Dictionary on here. Now let's just see what it has to say. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, my friends. I'm just getting ready to fall out of my step here. And status, status, no status quo. Okay, well, we're going to look up what status quo means. The more things change, the more it stays the same, right? Ah, precisely. Walking anti-matter at its finest. 
being on a microphone, they didn't want to talk down their butts. And they, they're going to say, all the Republicans fought for these wars. Yeah, well, it's okay if you're a dummy. And um, all that good stuff. All right. Look at what status quo means from Merriam-Webster Dictionary. I'll add that to the memo as well. Existing a state's affairs seeks to preserve the status quo. That's what it means. Same crap over and over again as the world turns. So I'm going to leave that up there. Let your folks understand where I'm coming from, which is okay. And I'm um, going to do one more thing here by Ethan Indigo Smith, who's a contributor. Lessons from George Orwell's 1984. And there's a reads here from Waking Times. Political language is designed to make lies sound truthful and murder respectable and give it an appearance of solidarity to pure wind. George Orwell. Some fictional literature is so profound as to be relevant for decades. George Orwell's time of 1984 is one such literary work. Literary work. One of the most influential books of our time. Its message resonates today as much as it did when it was first published over 65 years ago. As shown by its recent surge to the number one spot on Amazon's bestseller list. So what can 1984 teach us about the modern day? At its core, a post-World War II interpretation of the relationship between individuals and institutions. It changes the course of social history by spawning new language relating to the structure and mechanism of our society expanding the scope of human language and thought, and therefore humanity's understanding of itself. And that legacy seems perfectly fitting for in the history of 1984. The world is controlled by so many restrictions that even expensiveness of the official language. Newspeak is deliberately narrowed by the ruling institutions in a way that limits the ability of individuals to express thought crime, that which is deemed illegal by their inner party, the state. As a work of fiction, 1984 stark view of Burgoyne, cultural of totalitarianism, as a work of symbolism, however, it stands as a reflection of the modern fact in the USA and the world today. Within this narrative, the first five freedoms of the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution were infringed and removed in particular. The freedom of speech was so restricted that there was only one source of news operated by the official governing body and the entire branch of government was dedicated to steadily eliminating language deemed detrimental to the state. Or will create new phrases like new speak, the official limited language, as an antonym old speak. Good think, thoughts are approved by the party, and his antonym, crime think, and double think, the normalized act of simultaneously accepting two contradictory beliefs. New language allowed his narrative to portray and expose age-old structures of thought and language manipulation, structures that have exponentially escalated in a modern day. In 1984, all opposition is controlled and absorbed into the background. Big Brother is the human image that represents the inner party and the party line via the telescreen providing an official narrative while appropriating and misrepresenting the notion of brotherhood and unity into a brand name, one that is actually instilled a psycho psychology of collectivism, not brotherhood, not just as the controllers, in our own world instilled nationalism and war-mindedness in the name of freedom and liberty. Indeed, the telescreen is the primary means through which norms were forced on society and false imagery 
and they're just embedded in this collective consciousness. Totally transfixed on the party line as told by the telescreen. The fictional society of 1984 has lost the ability to think such it will believe 2 plus 2 is 5 as the saying goes. As long as it presented as such on the telescreen, they have been captive to set up their entire lives and with language and thought restricted and outlawed. They are blind to their own captivity, unable to discern for themselves. Thus, lies are made to, to be truths, using logical so distorted that it not only convinces the masses that 2 plus 2 equals 5, but that war is peace, freedom is slavery, and ignorance is strength. In reality, individual ignorance is strength to institutions, such distortions of language and thought. And, incidentally, history are perfect means by which to dis disempower and co-op an entire society. Means that they are not limited to the works of fiction. Orwell knew that idea that, that ideas do not exist separately from language. Language in both spoken and written forms is essentially to our ability to form and communicate thoughts and ideas. This is why today the United States government, the shadow power brokers that control it, and the mainstream media that support it, the, the entirety of which is owned by only six corporations, continue their war on fake news, i.e. ideas that are skeptical of government pronouncements and information that proves to be false, taking aim not just at independent journalism but independent thought itself while government surveillance of its own people continues to increase. Government secrecy is at an all-time high. The sharing of ideas that challenge the status quo is becoming more heavily censored. Releasing information on institutional and state activity is now punishable by law. Whistleblowers the inside the state are systematically destroyed. If that wasn't Orwellian enough, Donald Trump's advisors have begun co coining phase phrases like alternative facts. And we have to see, have even seen the creation of an Aurelian Ministry of Truth, an international fact-checking network charged with deciding what is the truth and what is fake news. If the events of 1984 continue to hold true and the ruling party of today gets its way, words and ideas will soon become not only censored but illegal and eliminated altogether. Controlled by increasingly totalitarian governments steering in our society down a dystopian path of censorship, blind belief, and misinformation, all in the name of the state. However, as our minds are freed one at a time, we are ultimately find that our society is heavily embedded with such norms and structures that perpetuate it, false imagery, preserving the status quo of the state from the threat of individual thinking. Hence the modern war on fake news. We are beginning as a society to question such falsehood and exercise our inherent freedom to expose it. Freedom is the freedom to say that 2 plus 2 make 4. If that is granted, all else follows. George Orwell. The last man in Europe. The original working to 1984 what title was The Last Man in Europe. The descriptive and evocative title idea provides a clear glimpse into George Orwell's intent escapulates a main point of 1984, a title perhaps too revealing to be anything but a working title. Certainly, this, that is the way many of us feel when we first become aware of lies and partial truths that are presented as reality by those in control of our society today, and accept it in totality by seemingly everyone else. It is if we are the last lone person. Indeed, the road of the free thinker can be a lonely and the story protagonist Patriot Winston Smith is made to believe he is the last person who questions, who looks, listens, and speaks. In a totalitarian society, be it Orwell, fictional world, or the increasingly authoritarian political regime of today, the official narratives portrayed by the official media portray that, is a, that a society is in consensus with the state and that, and that those engaged in thought crime, whether or not is legally a crime, 
are isolated social outcasts and lunatics and demeaned as rebels and conspiracy theorists, despite the existence of actual conspiracy against which are the true, the conscious mind, but inviolably rebel, rebel. Yet, in reality, crime think is what differentiates, the differ, the differentiates we free thinkers from those who are lost in the spell of societal illusion and therefore pose a threat to the status quo of the state. But this is part of the trap of good think. It creates the illusion of consensus and therefore endangers isolation in those who do not concede. As a master of his craft, nothing Oro wrote was cut was off the cuff. Now, it is not overtly spoken in the book, but there are four types of people in the fictional realm of 1984. There are three described classes and a, and a suggested fourth. Only later it is implied that the Brotherhood and the establishment rebels has been eliminated from the narrative, just as those in power sought to eliminate them from society. Interesting there because um, the truth of the matter is, it's just like you gotta be aware of these buzzwords. You have to look at things more clearly. It gives some person come on to be a maverick, but he can still be in disguise. It's okay to question these individuals and see things a lot broader, examine things more thoroughly. All right? And even the ones you supported. Donald Trump, for an example. Don't sit back. Put their feet to the fire. Be vigilant. He's a servant, not your Lord and Savior. He's just an example I want to use. And you see that with the Obama administration, too. They all like foaming at Pablo's dogs, all of them, oh my God, we want, we're free. Same shit. Different package. And I don't know, I don't like using vulgarity, but. This is how I see things. But I will continue on here. The secret to 1984 is four. 1984 is part and expose the four basic types of people in a society of four types of institutions. The four types of institutional lives that enable them. Characterized by how they respond to information, modern societies are made up of four archetypes of people. Idiots, zealots, elitists, and patriots. Idiots refuse information. Zealots blindly refute information. Elitists misuse information, and patriots seek and distribute information, despite dramatic alterations in the world geopolitical landscape. World's geopolitical landscape, and some fluctuation of individuals from one group row to another over time. The dynamic between these groups has historically remained the same and are inviolably intertwined. Idiots avoid all new pertinent information in order to maintain their perspective, never question the status quo. Zealous ask certain questions of certain information, ignoring unaligned information in order to maintain their perspective, support the status quo at all costs. Elias question information in order to manipulate and reap gains of those who don't know, benefiting from the status quo. Patriots question information to educate themselves and share it with others in order that we might enhance our lives and progress beyond the status quo. It is no wonder then that the Patriot has been all but deleted from today's socio-political landscape with those acting as true Patriots being demonized by the state and the meaning of the word Patriot distorted and confused by the likes of George W. Bush Jr., to mean an unquestioning, flag-waving, with us or against us spread of nationalistic idiocy. Check out my art. Check my article, First Amendment: The Real Patriot Act, for a deeper discussion of this. Using a practice so well defined by Orwell that is known today as Orwellian speak, institutions transfer and confuse words and ideas by mixing up themselves, their policies, and their products with patriotic ideas. And words. They take the meaning of words and archetypes and flip them on their on their heads. War is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength, and true patriotism. Such as that, that shown by government whistleblowers is traitorous. In reality, true patriots are the rebels who see through the lies of institutions and act knowingly. 
are removed from public consciousness in exactly the same way. In a Orwellian fashion, the fourth deleted class people in 1984, the Brotherhood, who are working to bring down the fascists in their party, are deleted through the admission of language. The other three types, which are specifically mentioned in the book within the book, the fictional, the theory, and practice of oligarchical Arlic, collectivism, are the high, the middle, and low castes. Similarly, the other three types of people depicted in the society of Oceania are the inner party, the outer party, are the proles. Proles. Social classes interact very little. The inner party and outer party make 2% of the population and are institutionalized controllers of Oceania. They are acting to modern politicians and financial elite, working with and against one another and clamoring to gain and maintain power. They have privileges the other castes do not, including being able to temporarily turn off the propaganda spooling telescreens. However, there is a pecking order within the party. The outer party are given state administrative jobs and are composed of the more educated members of society. They are responsible for the direct implementation of the party's policies, but have no say in decision making. They are the artificial middle class and as such have strict rules applied to them. They are allowed no vices other than cigarettes and victory gin, are spied on via their telescreens, and are encouraged to spy on each other and to report suspicious activities to Big Brother. The lower class of workers that perform the majority of menial tasks and labors are known as pro, pro, prolis. Proles, okay? They live in the poorest of conditions and not educated and instead are kept entertained with alcohol, gambling, sports, and pornography called prolifeed, 1984 equivalent of bread and circus. According to the inner party and the telescreen control, it controls those who might challenge the system. The important fourth type of person simply do not exist. The Brotherhood, the organization of a patriot, are portrayed by the controlling inner party as only a rumor and the notion of their existence is belittled by the inner party. Via the telescreen, in Oceania, if the telescreen is to be believed, there are no patriots, nor is such action allowed. And anyone who thinks they are isolated by a divide and conquer tactic used by empires past and present Thus, like so many in our failing society, Smith believes himself to be the last man in Europe. I had another quote. During the times of universal deceit, telling the truth becomes the revolutionary act. George Orwell. And yet, as the character of Winston Smith accurately observes in his diary, if there is any hope, it lies with the proles just as our hope for today lies with the so-called 99%. The proles in our society must begin to look beyond the bread and circus, beyond the prolifeed, and become a truth brotherhood and sisterhood by questioning information, educating themselves, and sharing what they learn with others in order that we might overcome institutional oppression and finally create the golden age that is our combined potential. Absolutely. I will continue on here. God and gold is within. We shall meet in the place where there is no darkness. George Orwell, 1984. Nothing Orwell wrote was by accident. And the name of the character who leads the Brotherhood Rebellion is named Emmanuel Goldstein. A name that translates roughly, roughly means God. Emmanuel and gold are with Goldstein. The use of this character named by Orwell asserts a developed, even transmuted human being who has transcended the imposed limitations of the system he is opposed to and grown from dual to the redefined, disempowered, and empowered. It also reveals Orwell's knowledge 
of how such patriotism and rebellion can become revolution. The word pro is short for proletariat, proletariat, a French word derived from the Latin proletarius, meaning a man who is only wealth in his offspring or whose sole service to the state is as its father. A word evoking pure institutionalized collectivism. It suggests that the individual has no value other than the labor and progeny, progeny he provides to the state. If you only value to the state as a breeder and consumer, well, what kind of world does that does? Sorry, would that result? Now compare the definition to the Emmanuel Goldstein. Golden godliness is within. In complete contrast is the statement of the of inner development, of individual enlightenment and empowerment, which, as all well knew, are the only forces that can successfully lead a rebellion against the institutional oppression of both fiction and reality. See, so you see, the secret of 1984's four is the most powerful message in its in its omissions, in the omission of information, which is only way the party state can maintain authoritarian control. And in the deliberately omitted fourth human archetype, the righteous rebel, the marginalized voice of dissent who is led to believe he is the last man in Europe. But in fact, the last man in Europe is you and I. We are everywhere. And we, as we open our minds and our mouths and embrace the gold within, we will tell the lost narrative of the brotherhood turn and turn our pros into our brothers. That's Ethan Indigo Smith. Powerful stuff, my friend. My friends. I like it a lot. This is why we have the technology now. We can make things happen. Don't be afraid of speaking your mind. Always have merit. Rather than being a parrot, when you have, if you're criticizing, protesting on somebody, have your facts, plant those seeds. You could be an activist in multiple avenues, rather is writing, podcasting, on the streets. It can be done on how you feel you're your best at. A little rebellion now and then is good, Thomas Jefferson stated. This information war is very spiritual to many of us. Plant those seeds, not no tree. Govern your own destiny. Don't let the government, whether it's federal, state, or local, dictate to you. They want to be your nannies. Tell them, stick it. I choose my path and destiny, not you. Plain and simple. One day, that's going to really make waves, which I see seeing happening, but expect to hit walls, jump hurdles, and hit potholes. That's what life is. That's what movements, what history of movements are about. Always to exercise eternal vigilance and share that with the other one you love. No more excuses. Choose your battles wisely. Keep everything in a balanced factor. And that is all, my friends. I thank everyone for listening to this episode. Plus, feel free to download and share throughout your social media networks. If you have any questions, comments, or you want to send me something that's interesting I may want to check out, whatever you do, please address your correspondences with Decorum. You can hit me on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, Tumblr, YouTube, Freedoms Network, Scene.Life, or Minds.com. In addition, you can email me at LokiLuck3 at gmail.com, which is LokiLuck and the number three all together. I may have a couple more emails I may put out there in the near future. It's gonna, I'm, I'm going to be choosy on it. Because, uh, you know, stuff is happening, non-encrypted emails, a lot of controversies 
other sites and so forth and to open them up. That's all good. All right, my friends. Once again, thank you for your time. Plus, always remember that the maniac resistance is healthy for the soul and can liberate humanity. Until next time, take care of yourselves. Keep on spreading the love. And may your guardian spirits be with you.